Coming up, foreign aid and African governance. Growing up in Africa, it's pretty clear that um, many people experience the difficulties and the disappointments around the aid regime on a daily basis. Zambian economist Ambisa Moyo discusses foreign aid in the developing world, China's role in Africa, and a possible resource war. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. When it comes to tough analysis of developing and emerging economies, Dambisa Moyo is one of the few Africans speaking out about these issues in Western media. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying she relies solely on lived experience. Moyo has a doctorate in economics from Oxford, a master's from Harvard, professional experience at Goldman Sachs and the World Bank, and three New York Times bestsellers under her belt, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Moyo writes regularly for the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. She's on multiple boards, including Barclays, and she's been named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. How did you first start to develop the opinion that aid to Africa is harmful? So it's funny because I don't think there was sort of one epiphany. And I remember while I was writing the book and traveling home and having dinners with uh, many of my African friends, they would roll their eyes and say, please, it's so obvious. I mean, you know, that's who, no one's going to buy that book. It's going to be, you know, it's so obvious. And mm. spending time with, with many African friends, it was not a, a sort of obvious pitch that uh, the the sort of disappointments associated with the aid programs and the efforts from the international community to really drive economic growth and reduce poverty, um, the fact that those, those programs had failed was not something that people in Africa would find particularly shocking. Um, you can imagine that we're talking about, you know, 40, 50 years um, after independence, where there was there were lots of promises made around the reduction of poverty and increasing economic growth, and these are very very important to stress because these are the two key things that aid promised to do. It promised to create economic growth and promised to reduce poverty, and in those two metrics, it clearly has failed. And so when people say, oh, but you know, we're providing aid, we're helping with healthcare, or providing aid and helping with education, they're missing the fundamental point that that is not the responsibility of the international community. Ultimately, it's the responsibility of governments to deliver that. It's very important that governments are held to task for the provision of those public goods like education and healthcare and infrastructure and national security, because that is the backbone of democracy. So in essence, um, if you spend time you know, being raised in Africa through primary school, secondary school, my formative years were in Africa, second, um, plus tertiary un up to university, but also being sick in an African hospital, which I have experienced, um, you can't escape the, the sort of the aid culture mm -hmm. and, it's, and the difficulties and the problems that it, it, it sort of uh, imbues in a society. And I think the, for me, if I had to pick one point at which I thought gosh, this is actually, um, I hadn't realized how stark the uh, problem of aid was, was when I started working on the trading floors um, in an investment bank. And I looked around the trading floors, and this was around 2001, 2002, and there were people from all over the world, people from Argentina, from um, Turkey, from Taiwan. And there were just almost no Africans. And at that time, um, this was a few, you know, a decade ago now, 20% um, of the world's population was from Africa. And I couldn't understand, excluding myself, of course, why it was that there weren't more Africans um, on the trading floors. And I don't believe that people are sort of sitting behind a dark curtain saying we better not hire Africans. But it goes back to the origins. Why were there not enough um, people that were considered educated enough to be on these trading floors? And of course, you know, Africans have a lot of choices. They can go back home, they can work in the civil service, but it just seemed to me this was a microcosm um, of uh, a, a broader problem. And going back to, um, you know, going back to Africa and growing, growing up in Africa, it's pretty clear that um, many people experience the difficulties and the disappointments around the aid regime on a daily basis. And it's not something that you have a eureka moment about. We live this on a daily basis. The political infrastructure, the corruption, the um, lack of infrastructure, the lack of education, lack of public goods, lack of investment from government. It's clearly and inextricably linked to the fact that the governments are not accountable, and that is linked to the aid programs. Mm -hmm. So it's an enormous industry, the aid community and the development community. Sure is. And there are a lot of voices saying, yes, there must be reform, but that doesn't mean we should throw 
all eight out the window. So how do you how do you respond to that? So I think there are two parts to answer that question. First of all, um, I never said turn off the taps. I know that that was the way it was characterized, and I think it's it's people who don't want to have a serious conversation. You know, I understand my country's heavily dependent on aid. It would be absurd for anybody to stand up and say turn off the taps. You know, we are heavily reliant on health care through the PEPFAR program, heavily reliant on education programs, on, on infrastructure, are lots of programs that are supported by the aid regime. Um, so it, many people came out and they tried to discredit me as saying, oh, she's saying turn off, um, turn off the aid immediately. This is, you know, she's uh, um, killing off Africans. I mean, I was mm -hmm. accused of, of some pretty um, hurtful things. Um, but I, I really looked at that as people trying to discredit what in their hearts they knew to be a system that needed to be questioned. Um, but more fundamentally than, than that view, I think we're spending way too much time um, focusing on and pursuing policies that we actually know don't work. There's no evidence of them working. With over 300 years of uh, economic history around what works and what doesn't work, we, don't, we know that aid is not the tool for generating economic growth and meaningfully putting a dent in poverty. And whether that's data from looking at Western countries, the United States and many European countries, the success of those economies, or whether it's looking at the, these new raft of economies that have done phenomenally well in transforming uh, their societies, whether it's China or Brazil or India, we know that these countries are not dependent on aid to the extent that African countries are. And so what is wrong with us questioning that? Mm -hmm. um, there, I think we all ultimately want to see Africa as an equal partner on the global stage, and we should want that. But we should also recognize that we do know that things like trade are essential for Africa to become a global partner. We need to trade in order to do that. When the United States and European countries put subsidy programs that lock out African produce, um, those are the questions we should ask. We shouldn't be campaigning for more aid money. You know, what are we going to do about that? When we've seen the biggest bull market in commodity prices over the last decade, we ought to ask African governments, what have you done with that money? Mm. You know, these are large copper producers, gold producers, platinum producers. What have they done with the money? And those are the sort of questions that I really think um, ethically and morally um, society should be forcing, uh, forced to ask and ask and answer. You also brought up in your remarks a little earlier something else that goes to um, accountability, uh, which is that governments in Africa need to be accountable. And in order to be accountable, they have to be given a certain level of responsibility. I think it's, it's part of your reasoning. You talked about uh, how there has to be an appropriate sequencing. Uh, so democracy doesn't necessarily come before food mm. um, and hunger. Um, so can you? And that seems connected to me, to this idea that governments must be accountable. They, aren't necessar they don't necessarily need to be democracies, in your view. So can you sort of flesh that out a little bit? I am absolutely a supporter of democracy. I would have to be. I'm an African woman. I mean, if I would probably be the first victim of a lack of democracy. So of course I'm supportive of democracy. And I think we should all aspire to have liberal democracies wherever we are around the world. Um, but the, a couple of things on this point, and perhaps it shows my bias as an economist, um, but I do think that um, in order for us to create those liberal democracies where we are able to hold our governments accountable, you need a critical middle class. And I think as long as you have a situation where the middle class does not exist, you have the vulnerabilities of illiberal democracies. And with numerous of them, or, or numerous uh, numbers of uh, numerous... Uh, examples of, um, of illiberal democracies around the world. I have to remind you of what the democratic contract is. It's a very simple contract, and within that contract, there's an implicit and, I would say, explicit agreement that the government will tax us, and in return, the government promises to provide, provide this suite of public goods, which is education and health care, small question mark. I know I'm in the United States, so health care might not be a public good. Um, <laughs> infrastructure, national security, lots and lots of things like this. And the, the contract's very simple. Government, you can tax me, but you have to provide me with these goods. If you don't provide me with these book goods, I will boot you out. I will basically not uh, re-elect you at the next campaign. And it's very important that that contract is held sacrosanct, because if that contract is severed, then the government can run roughshod um, mm. around, uh, around the country. And if you look at what has happened in places like Africa is that the aid system has severed that link. 
it means that the governments very rationally, and I think this is very important because people tend to think of African leaders as sort of bumbling idiots who don't know what's going on. They are very rationally choosing to court and cater um, international donors, knowing fully well that the donors will, and, and this is an African president who said this to me, the system is so rotten to the core that the more poverty, the more disease you can show, the more aid money you receive. Mm -hmm. So it's not given to you as a reward, it's given to you um, in, in lieu of um, what should be, what should be a, re a reward. But the point about this is that if you sever that link between the individual and the government, and our governments are very rationally spending their time courting and catering to the donors, um, we as Africans are not able to hold our governments accountable when they do not provide us with the suite of goods that I just mentioned to you. What you end up with in the worst case scenario is what we're seeing, I believe, across the Middle East now. Um, a lot of people look at the Middle East and they say it's about democracy. I mean, to me, it's about the, the fact, partly about democracy, but much more about the fact that the governments have failed to deliver economic growth. Um, they failed to meaningfully put a dent in poverty. And you must remember that 90% of the world lives in the emerging markets. And the, in those emerging markets, 60 to 70% of the world, uh, of those populations are under the age of 24. Mm -hmm. Very young, very impatient, um, and you know they are not going to tolerate what many of us tolerated when we were growing up in places like Africa. Um, they simply will not accept that. And it's really the onus is on places like the United States and Europe to deliver and to show that private capitalism and democracy um, are the way to go. And it's a very, very difficult um, test. What happens in 2020, 2030, when China becomes the largest economy in the world? Remember, she's the number two economy in the world today after the United States. So you've got the United States, $14 trillion GDP, $15 trillion. Um, it's got democracy as a political ethos. It's got private capitalism as its economic platform. You have China, the number two largest economy in the world. Um, it has about $7 trillion uh, GDP. It has no democracy as its political infrastructure, and it has state capitalism as its political uh, economic ethos. Both, I was just looking at Gini coefficients, which is the measure of income inequality, nearly the same Gini coefficient. I think the United States is at 47, China is at 45. Same Gini coefficient. 90%, as I mentioned, of the world's population is living in the emerging markets, and we're sitting there thinking, who's going to win this race? Now, we tend to discount the China story. Oh, China is going to conform to democracy. And as I said to you, I'm a big supporter of democracy, and I hope we live in a liberal democracy, a world of liberal democracy. But what happens when China becomes the largest economy in the world? Well, I actually I wanted to ask you about China, um, because you've written some positive things about China you know, the, uh, and their involvement in Africa and their role in Africa. You've written a lot about what they're doing in the resource wars and how they're gaining on the U.S. Um, what do you think of China? Do you think there's potential there? Do you think they could be a good world leader, a good world influence? Well, I think, first of all, um, people forget that although, having just said that they are the second largest economy in the world, they're number, around number 100 on a per capita income basis. So this is a very, very poor country that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. People also forget that there are more poor people in China than there are in Africa. There are more poor people in India than there are in Africa. So while we're all obsessing about, oh, we need to give more aid to Africa and let's feel sorry for the Africans, remember that the political imperative of China is that they have to deliver economic growth, they have to reduce poverty because they will have a political crisis on their hands if they do not do that. So against that backdrop, um, I think it's a, it's a fantastic lens through which to, to look at what China is doing around the world. The brilliance of the Chinese campaign is that they are very heavily reliant on what I call symbiosis or this axis of the unloved. So they're going to the countries, countries in Africa, but also in South America, across Eastern Europe, and they're going to these places that desperately need foreign direct investment, desperately need to trade. We need to do that. Our populations are incredibly young. We have to do that. And China is willing and able to invest in these markets. I wish the United States would do much more. Um, in fact, I just had a, a meeting with a diplomat, American diplomat, while I was in Africa last month. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that the United States is grappling with. But if you travel across Africa, you'll be hard-pressed to see an American car. 
-hmm. It's flooded with Asian vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of lots of issues going on there. And I'm not trying to be an apologist for China. Of course, there are numerous issues that once again, our governments have to deal with in terms of labor laws, environmental concerns. But ultimately, once again, it's up to our governments to deliver that. It's not good enough for finger wagging from journalists uh, sitting in the West. We need that aid uh, in that form. And, and don't mean aid as in, uh, I mean aid as in support as opposed to aid as in uh, grants. Um, but, and I think the, the faster we stop scaremongering about China and start to view them as a necessary partner, mm. um, I think the sooner we'll get to a, a better solution for all. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the resource wars and uh, your latest book, Winner Take All, in which you point out that China is amassing these enormous reserves of commodities. Is this really a zero-sum game? I mean, the fact that China has this big reserve of commodities mean they're winning a war that someone else necessarily needs to lose? Well, I hope not, uh, in, in the sense that um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was I've been shocked at how big the commodity uh, scarcity problem really is and how little time on a global sort of integrated, coordinated approach um, we are spending uh, as an international community on this issue. Um, the tendency has been to address the big demand and supply imbalances that, by the way, we're facing today, but we'll face much more acutely in the years to come. We've tended to face those in a very unilateral way. And to me, I find that, I find that quite astonishing because whether you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, very basic education, you know, we need to feed people. And we're spending so much time and energy on the financial crisis, of course, through the G20. We're looking at the Copenhagen consensus, looking at environmental concerns. The WTO is focused on uh, trade, but there is no single body today that only focuses on the commodity scarcity issue. Now, of course, international multilateral institutions do look at some of these concerns, but I found it astonishing that there's not one body that does nothing else but focus on commodity scarcity. And yet, I think uh, that this is the big problem that we are all going to face, and we are already. And by the way, while we are all busy doing other stuff, China has come up with a very systematic, very deliberate plan to, uh, to acquire resources, which, as I mentioned earlier, is very symbiotic. Um, you know, they are investing in these economies, and to me, um, rather than, again, just find the weaknesses in, in China's uh, agenda. I think we all need to sit down and really think about what we're going to do when the world population hits 9 billion at, in 2050. And uh, you know, we continue to suffer these problems of uh, having too much uh, salty water on, on Earth and not enough to deliver um, basic human sustenance. It's wonderful to hear your answers. Thank you so much. And, Thank you for having and me here. And let's, let's have an applause. Thank and then. <laughs> If Jeffrey Sachs were sitting in this room, would you be able to come to a, a consensus with him by the end of the evening? Jeffrey Sachs taught me for a year at Harvard. And I think if there was one point when I just thought, I cannot believe that somebody would do this, um, is when I saw uh, Jeffrey Sachs' comments about uh, my book. Um, because he taught me. I paid good money. My parents broke their backs in Africa. You know, uh, the, the, during my day, fees in, at Harvard were $30,000 a year at a time when my country's per capita income was $250 a year. And so I thought I was getting a good education. I sat in this class for a year, and all he talked about was the importance of restructuring governments, the importance of uh, making sure that we had capital markets, we had trade, we had foreign direct investment. And so it seemed to me that his policies and framework applied to everybody else. And then when it came to Africa, oh, that's a very different kettle of fish. Africans, we need to give them aid. But everywhere else, they should be doing trade and funder. And that's what I thought was completely hypocritical. Um, and um, so, you know, every superhero needs a villain. I, I'm probably his villain. And if he were here, I would say, I think he owes me some money back from the Harvard education <laughs> at the time. Um, but coming to the, well, just, I mean, to be honest, just on, on that very, point, um, just to be a bit serious, I would hope that there was a meeting of the minds. Because it, it seems to me it's very difficult in my mind to square the circle around people who say, we respect Africans, we want Africans to be our peers, and people who then go around campaigning for you know, more aid. You know, where are our governments? Why are our governments not standing up and articulating a, a, a vision around 
what the world should look like, what, why Africa has struggled to um, really to do what, what we needed to do in terms of economic growth and reduced poverty. Um, you know, as an African, I don't want to hear from the rock stars. I want to hear their music, and I love their music, but I don't want to hear them designing African policy. It's a waste of our time. I would hope that um, Jeff Sachs actually has um, come around um, to, to the real world and has come around to the fact that Africans deserve to be around the table having those discussions. And it shouldn't be the case that we have people who are not elected um, attending the most important meetings in the world, speaking on behalf of um, you know, nearly a billion Africans um, with information that's incorrect. Do you believe, as some other scholars have started to, to claim or state, that there are conditions ripe in Africa for um, a sort of state capitalism or communism, uh, sort of a, according to the Chinese model, to emerge uh, out of this symbiosis that's being created on the basis of aid and development? I've spent all my life um, believing, subscribing, supporting democracy and private capitalism. That's what we were taught. That was the ethos that America went out and had spread to the world. Um, but unfortunately, it has not delivered um, as fast as it needed to deliver so that people felt that there was garnering benefits. And what we have now is a situation where there's another model, um, which is ostensibly delivering economic growth. It is dramatically reducing poverty. I mean, we know 300 million Chinese out of poverty in the past 30 years. And to many policymakers that I spend time with, I've been very fortunate, I've been able to travel to over 50 countries around the world. Many of them are saying, well, you know what? We'd love to have a democratic process. We'd love to have private capitalism, because that seems to be a model that uh, actually appeals to uh, an individual's uh, attributes. But here we have another model, a competing model that seems to deliver much faster. I do think that the pressure is on and should be on um, the United States and European countries to actually go out and explain and pursue and to show that actually their model is the better model, even though it might be painful in the, in the years to come. Because right now, many African leaders, many South American leaders, many people from uh, Eastern Europe are spending a heck of a lot of time in China um, trying to learn what it is about their model of state capitalism that actually can help deliver uh, economic growth and reduce poverty in a meaningful way. I think that that is where the world is right now. I think that it really is uh, in this, shall we say, pivot point where people are actually looking to China um, and the Chinese model as a solution. It's not to say that the Chinese model has no weaknesses. I think there are numerous weaknesses, there are enormous deadweight losses. But think about it, if you're sitting as the president of a poor country right now, and you have to deliver, otherwise you're going to have, you know, your political imperative is that you either get voted out by democracy or you run the risk of getting thrown out because of people demonstrating. Um, you basically are looking at whatever model you can that's going to deliver economic growth. And, uh, you know, people, in particular, in a very impatient way. And I think that uh, one of, for me, one of the real uh, interesting live experiments that I've experienced is going to both India and China. To me, they're fantastic real life experiment, and I urge people, if you haven't already, you must go to both. Um, India, democracy, a billion plus people. China, no democracy, um, and also a billion plus people. Um, you can tell that in China, the government is involved. You know, the roads are there, it's, and India is a very different place. I, my, my, it was quite surprising to me how, uh, how absent the government was. And so I think it's the case of the role of government being bigger and much more uh, driving state capitalism, I think, is something that's going to gain momentum. We have situations where um, there are governments such as uh, the government in Ethiopia, Rwanda, uh, that have ruled with a bit of an iron fist, but at the same time have presided over uh, economic growth uh, and innovation. For instance, the commodities exchange in Ethiopia is a really innovative uh, solution to some of their challenges. Uh, how do you reconcile those two tensions? I actually view political uh, intrusions or excursions, shall we say, to be polite, um, as, um, as difficult things for us to, as economists, to get our heads around, because it's very hard for us to uh, understand that their utility functions are very different from ours. We kind of say, well, people want to eat, therefore they will act because they want to eat, whereas politicians, you never really know what the story, what story is going on. But what does that mean for leadership uh, in Africa? I actually think we're doing better than we have in the past. Um, it's been slow grind, and it, there's a heck of a lot more work to be done. 
Um, but I think that what's really important is for the international community to embrace and to support the people um, and the leaders who are actually doing the right thing. And I take you back to the comment I made earlier, which was the flippant remark from a president in Africa who said, well, you have to understand that this is all very rational. You know, we uh, are rewarded for showing worse statistics. Now, that type of absurdity is something that we should find objectionable. And it's very clear that there are a number of African presidents who have said, you know what, we really want to work hard to wean ourselves off of aid. We want America to be a part of our success plan and success story. But we know that America's support cannot be in a situation of just writing checks. And those leaders are the ones I think that the US should support and engage with and encourage investment. Um, I really look forward to the day that we hear much more positive news um, from the leadership here um, and the policymakers here about what's going on in Africa. Because what's missing to me is we don't see many um, Western businesses investing in Africa. Um, it's, the place is crawling with Asian businesses, but you don't see a lot of American investors. We see a lot of American <laughs> NGOs, a lot of Western NGOs, but not enough of the big businesses that have made this economy what it is. So coming to the leadership point, I would say we, just, we should basically raise up and support and even reward, um, financially reward, the governments that actually do the right thing. And we should shame, name and shame the governments that are doing the wrong thing. And we know who they are. Again, it's not a big secret. Great. <laughs>